I'm Laura Flanders. Well, today, from Occupy Wall Street to the streets of Greece, people taking to the streets, calling for a halt to business as usual, have created a sense that something significant is afoot. What exactly hasn't always been clear, and often the money media don't know or care to ask. The excitement usually diminishes, the protesters leave the headlines, and we're all encouraged simply to forget. Two people who do know how to ask and have participated in those protests for themselves join us next. Far from forgetting, they've written an investigative account looking at revolts in the U.S., Greece, Argentina, Spain, and Venezuela. It's called They Can't Represent Us, Re Reinventing Democracy from Greece to Occupy. And I'm happy it's brought Marina Citron and Dario Azzolini to the show. Thank you so much for coming in. It's great to have you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for inviting us. Now, you mentioned, Marina, what happened before Occupy even became public, that there was a backstory, mm -hmm. as it were. And you make that point in the book, mm -hmm. that although to the outside, a lot of these protests looked like spontaneous eruptions, they really weren't. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, I mean, they, were sp they weren't spontaneous. There were people who were organizing in all of these different locations, um, in Greece and in Spain, in Greece a number of years prior in assemblies. Um, but the, the massivity of them. Well, that's, I think, that the kind of the new and what seems spontaneous. But they did represent a kind of break, I mean, a rupture. Rupture is the word that you use. So how are we to understand that, Dario? So con continu continuation or real juncture? Well, I think it's both. It's continuation in a sense that we historically always had experiences uh, like that, but they used to be a, a minority experience. Like the leading would be like the, the party, the union, the the representational mode and now I think the new thing is and and that's the rupture it's a rupture where f on the first hand people break with, with representation they don't want to be represented anymore it doesn't work for them it doesn't work the, the electoral system doesn't work the unions didn't couldn't stop the austerity uh, all that so they're like doing politics in in the first person they're there and I think that's an, a very important break. And the very important break is also that while historically these currents were a minority uh, current in, in the left and in the, the, let's say, the current of change, now they're a majority. Most people don't believe anymore that representative democracy can represent them, that it does anything for them, and want to take life in their own hands and not like give it away to have someone else deciding. And are you um, shedding differences a bit to include Venezuela and Argentina, whose uprisings that you, you describe way predated occupying mm -hmm. Greece and who, was mm -hmm. who were prompted, if you like, by pretty different things and who've mm -hmm. produced very different things, mm -hmm. uh, clumping them all in with, mm -hmm. with Occupy and Greece. Mm -hmm. What were your criteria? Well, we actually look at Latin America as a whole. We just use Argentina and Venezuela as examples. And in the last, really, 20 years, um, and what we were looking at is this rejection of representation, the kind of the idea of having power over other people, so organizing in a more horizontal way, and self-organizing. So the point of reference of these movements that we're talking about in Latin America, and in fact, people are using the language in Latin America of societies and movement mm. rather than protest movement, mm. and it's because they're looking to one another to make that change rather than demanding it. Similar is that they're all pretty unresponsive states, with Venezuela being an exception, perhaps. Um, that people are forced to do it themselves and then choose to do it in this horizontal way, even using the same language of horizontal um, throughout. So we ground it in Latin America, which we think is really important. Well, that's a really important point that you raise. There is a structure. I mean, our, our money media, at least in the United States, talked a lot about anarchy and no one's in charge and there's no leaders. Um, but you make it very clear there is a structure here, you, horizontalism. You want, who wants to define that? I mean, that definitely comes from people in Argentina in, after 2001, and they did have an economic crisis, and people organizing, calling it horizontalidad, as a relationship, less a structure and a, as a way of relating. But in that relating, there are, I guess, implied structures. So the idea of not having you know, the power over each other, structures of power um, over each other, but having people deciding together how they're going to have the conversation. So that's the part that maybe seems like structure. So it's not chaos and everyone just gets together and speaks, but people come to agreements collectively and have conversations in that way or behave certain ways based on these agreements, including action agreements. Give us an example of how this plays out in some of the reporting or you know, witnessing that, that you did, Dario. Well, if we take like the maybe most advanced example of self-organizations would be like the communal councils and communes in Venezuela, which is uh, 
local self-administration, self-government, where you have different work groups, like very similar to the structure in Scotty Park or wherever, and all these movements where you have a huge assembly and then you break up in work groups. And the work groups elaborate different projects and things, but they have to carry them back to the assembly. The assembly then decides what to do and how, uh, and how to do it, and the details are obviously in, in the work groups, they're done in the work groups. It does not mean that you can discuss or did you discuss everything in the assembly. That would be impossible and would be an endless assembly. Um, so so you what kind of things are those work groups working on? In, in Venezuela, for example, about housing, about culture, about sports. They, um, we have very different examples. We have an example in the book of a commune uh, that means it's like different local councils, but they're not representative. They don't. They, they have just spokespeople, but nobody can decide without the local assembly, the neighborhood's assembly. And uh, we have one example. For example, they build. A f they're building a factory for prefabricated housing. So they have a carpentry. They're building walls. They have six huge ovens and build uh, for tiles, roof tiles, etc. Others have set up. A, a, a little transport uh, a cooperative and for the neighborhood. And you have one that's doing its own policing, its own security, and setting up alternative courts. That's an example we had from Mexico, Guerrero. from uh, mm -hmm. Guerrero, for example, where it's widespread because the, it's in indigenous communities, and they have a different uh, concept also from justice, just because locking people away doesn't change them. So what they do is like they have them in their communities, l lock them away at night, but during the day they're working. They're working in collective projects, uh, building schools, doing things that um, make them feel what is the sense of collectivity in society. And our point in not just showing these experiences from Latin America is to ground them historically and contextually, but then also to kind of help suggest possibilities for the newer movements today. One of the other large parts of your, your book is a f discussion of the worker takeovers of factories and different means of production. Um, let's talk about that when we come back. And before we do, take a quick look at the film the Take, which documents just some of this story coming out of Argentina. Here's a clip from The Take by Avi Lewis and Naomi Klein. Abrir el pecho y sacar el alma Una cuchillada de amor You have a wonderful line in the book where you say occupying public space was not just to take it over but to make it useful. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why people did it. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that for a little bit. Some of the examples we give say from Venezuela, Argentina and Greece are workplaces. So, and, and workers are using the language of recuperate. Um, so taking back, it's not just occupy it and make a demand or have a strike or a sit-in, um, but to take it back and recreate the relationships to one another, to work, um, and even to what people are producing over time. Often that there's a change in what's being produced um, that's happening particularly in Europe now or in Viomet in Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, so we see that in the workplaces and that's increasing. It's increasing also in Argentina with 68 um, new recuperations just in this last year, and all kinds of workplaces. We're talking about restaurants and health clinics and everything. You have a great uh, one, a hotel in Argentina, Bruin. Is a that hotel Bowen. 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 Yeah. yeah, and that's right in the center, and it's used by movements and all kinds of people to use it as a kind of social political space. It's very integral um, to the movements themselves, and that's what all of the workers tell us everywhere, is that we couldn't do this without the community, without the movements. Um, but we do see um, recuperation of sorts beginning now with the newer movements, newer meaning in Spain and Occupy in the U.S., um, not with workplaces so much, but say with housing, for example, mm -hmm. that the movements first to prevent foreclosures and to prevent evictions, now in places like Chicago in the U.S. and their conversations in New York, where people are talking to neighbors first, so using this kind of horizontal assembly mode, um, and then moving homeless families into abandoned homes mm -hmm. um, through talking to the community, and then the only 
thing that those people have to do is commit to participating in further assemblies and helping other families move in. So it's a similar idea of recuperation and, and challenging private property. During the last years or the last decades, uh, neoliberal capitalism has taken any public thing from us. I mean, the plazas or squares used to be a place where people sit, meet, now you cannot sit anymore there if you don't consume. If you, there are more than a few people, then uh, police shows up because it's suspicious. So that's the taking back. It's the, the taking back of, of, the, of community, of collectivity, of, of public in, without having to consume and to pay. So the public for the public and not for the wealth. You don't talk about the commons, but it sounds like in yes. a sense that's what you're talking yes, about. Yes, definitely. And this is the language people in the movements are using quite a bit, is the language of commons is kind of coming up and becoming really popular now. Yeah. So let's talk about what is going on in reaction, because in Greece you certainly have a very strong reaction to austerity, both the sort that you're describing and a very reactionary sort, the growth of the fascist movement. Um, Gold Dawn. Uh, in other parts of the world that you've covered, I'd be interested to know if you think there's a comparable thing. Um, but first, tell us a bit about where we stand in Greece, where politics stand right now, because for many that's been a very frightening story. Mm. It is. In Greece and, and in Europe, we can perhaps talk about it as a whole, but in um, Greece, the rise of Golden Dawn has been, while they existed um, because of the crisis, the group Golden Dawn not only has the racist and anti immigrant rhetoric, um, but what they've been doing is speaking to people, um, especially the elderly, and saying that they will help them. Mm. So they're organizing you know, as a fascist organization and trying to create a base in society. In response to that, the movements then have also had to focus on resisting that, both resisting the kinds of day-to-day -day organizing, um, but then also defending themselves and defending other people. What happened is the government then passed legislation um, against Golden Dawn which a lot of people saw as very positive. Mm -hmm. um, but many of the people in the movements we spoke to did not see it as positive because of the fear, and it's actually what's happening now, that that same legislation is being used against the movements. So to call participants in the movements terrorists, so people who've been organizing to prevent um, a mine in the mountain, a mountainous area outside of Thessaloniki, um, are being repressed with the same legislation um, that's used against Golden Dawn. So what is the relationship of the state to the organizations that you're talking about, and vice versa, their relationship mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. it? It sounds like there's a certain amount of ambivalence. The movements themselves are not, I mean, on the one hand, they're not looking to the state, but it's also because the states have not been responding in the past years to demands of people when organized. So the idea that people are looking to one another isn't just ideological, sometimes it is. Often it's because people have been completely abandoned by these institutions, so must look to one another. Um, and that is, I think, where some of the threat the state is feeling from the movements comes from. Because when a state is no longer has legitimacy with people in society and people are starting to self-organize and say, actually, we're going to organize something different, some other form of governance, um, the state obviously feels threatened. Um, so I don't think it is about the rise of the right or terrorism um, that the state is responding to and saying they need to repress. I actually think these different governments are responding to massive self-organization that's been taking place in society and that society is also turning its back on the state. Including in the U.S.? I think in the U.S. as well. In the U.S. we're um, a little more behind, say, Greece and Spain and a lot of the organizing. But in talking to people throughout the country, there's very much that sentiment that people don't feel represented and don't necessarily want to be represented. But the question is, so then what do we do? Yeah. How do we organize? And that's, that's the bigger question, is people are self-organizing more. Putting people in homes in the United States is a big deal, challenging private property and moving a family in. And once that begins to happen more, and the question is also, well, what's next? Will we take over workplaces? Will we take over just plots of land? Will we recreate governance altogether? It's a real threat. And to what extent are the groups that you're talking about, and again, I'm focusing a little bit on the United States here, but maybe as a useful contrast to the other places that you cover, to what extent is, imp is it important that there are larger movements or broader movements that they are a part of? We've talked about the relationship with mm. the state. What about mm. that relationship mm. to other movements? Because mm. without that, can you have a kind of structural change that you're talking about with this country being so enormous? We do need that. I think that's the kind of next, where so many of the Occupy groups went from being in central squares and plazas back to neighborhoods, and people have been working in neighborhoods and organizing. Yeah. What we're not doing is then coming again together in large numbers, and we need that. We need to see one another, partly just to affirm our sense of collectivity and mm -hmm. our sense of power. 
Um, but it is also where our power is located. It's not just because we feel better, but, but we do have power in organizing collectively. And to think about organizational networks and structures. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to think about that more in the U.S. And Spain, having been organizing um, for at least a year before we were in the U.S., we can look to how they both have been organizing concretely mm -hmm. in neighborhoods, um, but then also have been coming together by the hundreds of thousands um, and millions in the country. And it shows one of the things I saw in the book was it shows the difference um, or raises the question about some of the worker-owned cooperatives and worker-owned businesses that were started in, uh, out of protest. The ones that continue to have a relationship with movements are doing more, it seems to me, from what I read, of challenging power and democratizing processes than the ones who are simply filling a hole in the market, providing some product that's needed that they can sell. Definitely. We think that it's important to show that uh, if you want to survive on a long term in capitalism, you cannot create the, the happy island of, of, of cooperativism inside a sea of, of capitalism. So you have to rely, first of all, you have to rely on, on other structures, on other movements. But I think it's also a, a responsibility. First, these movements defend you and the factory when, when you have problems, when you had to occupy it, when you have to do the distribution. So, on the other hand, so I think there is also a responsibility to still s for the workers to see themselves as part of a bigger movement. So in terms of the big picture, I mean, there may be people watching this that say, these people are dreaming. We've got more powerful governments than we've ever had. We've got conflict in Venezuela. We've got, uh, you know, the continuing economic crisis, the people in need, needs are not being met. If everything was so fantastic, um, we would know about it by now. Uh, what, you want to respond to that? Because the gap between what people are probably aware of and what you're reporting is, is pretty large. It is large. Um, it's not being reported in the media, and I think there is a reason for that. Um, and dreaming is great. Dreaming <laughs> is a wonderful thing. Um, but it's, it's real. It's not just dreaming. Um, I think we need to dream more. But people are relating in these ways and caring for one another. Um, and I think if people look closer, they might even see certain spaces where it's happening. Um, maybe your neighbor asked if you're under threat of eviction and you didn't think twice about why they were asking you. Um, there, there are many, many places to look. And I think it's also something very, very human, very like it's part of humanity. I mean, apart from the fact that anthropologically we wouldn't have evolved, n not even to the Neanderthal, if, if uh, we would have been competing all the time and not cooperating. But even if I just stop anywhere where a person is begging and I look who's giving money, mm -hmm. it's the one that don't have money. It's mm -hmm. not the one that have it. So I think we can see how th this feeling of solidarity exists. And it's a hidden, it, it, it's somehow hidden knowledge of the marginalized because they couldn't survive in a different way. So we have it in indigenous groups and in poor communities and Afro-American communities. There is a knowledge how to do things differently and how to care. So maybe less of a rupture and more of a revival. Yeah, I think it's looking to who we are and what we are and, and I think helping to look to those places. It's great to have you on the program. They Can't Represent Us is available now from Verso, Marina Citron, Dario Ancelini. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and you're this, what's happening in Detroit is, is is a model for what could be happening in the nation. Instead of a nation for the 0.01 percent, it's a nation for all of us. This is a fight much more than the Democratic Party, much bigger than the Republican Party, much bigger than elections. This is a fight about whether or not you got the right to have some water in your house. Immediate 
institutions and privatize them. And now they want to take our water. So we have to wage a protracted struggle in order to beat back these attacks against the people here in the city of Detroit. Because soon enough, they will be coming to a city near you. We need you. We can't do this without you. I'm telling you, we've been trying for six weeks. And we have been working around the clock. to link what's happening in Detroit to what's happening across this country. Yes, yes. Yes. Detroit is where the fight begins. Yes. Yes. The message here is we got to hold these corporations responsible for this mess all together. Turn the water on. I will not compare slaughter to slaughter. I will not compare death to death. I will not compare. I will not compare. Welcome to my morning mantra. It's been a long, hot news summer, and it's important to remember the rules. Under prevailing US media law, you may not compare a killing to a killing. You may not say the word Palestinian, for example, and then in the same sentence say Yazidi. You may not compare. You may not compare. The rules are very clear, especially when it comes to the Middle East. I, for example, may not compare destruction to destruction. It is best, in fact, if I do not even contemplate or wonder about men and women and children trapped without food and medicine and drinking water under siege on a mountaintop and at the same time contemplate or wonder about men and women and children trapped without food and medicine and drinking water under siege in a place near a beach. A mountain under siege is not to be compared to a beach besieged. That's simple enough. After all, a mountain is very different from a beach. I will not compare, I will not compare. In particular, I will not compare a destroyed mosque in Mosul with a destroyed mosque in Kuza. And I absolutely will not compare the motivations of the uniformed soldiers whom I hear laugh and cheer on a videotape out of Gaza as they bomb that mosque in Kuza with the motivations of any men anywhere committing war crimes, even if I can't get that laughter and cheering out of my head. I may not compare. I may not compare. Why? Because comparisons are odious, of course, and politics is complicated. You heard the president. The U.S., quote, cannot and should not intervene every time there's a crisis in the world, close quote. Some require the U.S. to act to help the people besieged. Some require the U.S. to act to help the people doing the besieging. To compare is to risk blurring the differences. And the differences, you see, are all important. To recap the rules, it is wrong to compare. You cannot say a life is a life. You cannot say words like oil and money and markets. You cannot ask what's the difference between a mountain and a beach. I'm Laura Flanders for The Laura Flanders Show. Write to me, laura at grittv.org. Thanks.